Good morning, Colin, and good mor morning, Marion, and any others who are watching already. Um, we gather um, for our online service today, and it's just coming up to 10 o'clock on a very damp Sunday morning at the uh, last Sunday in July. Just think we'll soon be into August, and next week the football season starts, doesn't it? So that'll be something else um, for people to watch on television. Um, that hymn that I was pre playing there um, has got a chorus, Oh how I love the Saviour's name, Oh how I love the Saviour's name, Oh how I love the Saviour's name, the sweetest name on earth. So if I sing the first verse, or perhaps you can join in that chorus. There is a name I love to hear, I love to speak its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love the Saviour's name. Oh, how I love the Saviour's name. Oh, how I love the Saviour's name, the sweetest name on earth. Let's begin with a prayer together as we gather in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the love of God the Father, and the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Today we'll hear in our Gospel lesson about um, how Jesus speaks of the Kingdom of God as a treasure um, that is found like a pearl of great price, and we consider its, its great value to us um, to know and love the Saviour, um, to follow him. Today, in our prayers, I want to remember um, the Green family who um, yesterday they scattered the ashes of um, Fraser Green at, at, the, at the loch here. I want to remember, too, the family of the Reverend Malcolm Wright who passed away yesterday at Dunbarton Presbytery, a retired minister. Um, so remember his family and also um, those known to us who are unwell, including um, Margaret in hospital in Inverness. But first let us come to God in our prayers and come into the healing and renewing and saving presence of God, asking God to heal and to bless and to look after us and to forgive according to our need and according to God's great mercy. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are mighty God and Prince of Peace. Lord, have mercy. You are Son of God and Son of Mary, Christ of mercy. You are the made Word made flesh in the splendor of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, we come to you to praise and worship you, to acknowledge and glorify your name. We have come because you are the living God. How hard it is, Lord, in these times of lockdown, as we seek to be the church and to worship you in the different ways and circumstances that we face. How hard it is, Lord, for those who are sick, for those who are isolated, for those who are mourning, for those who are sad and lonely. Send your blessing, your help, and send your Holy Spirit to empower us, to help us live the Christian life. Help us to be kind and compassionate to one another, to know your mercy, love and grace and peace. Forgive our sins and bring us into the fullness of your joy and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. We praise you, Lord, for your wonderful goodness. We glorify your name and we worship you, the Lord without end, the God who has loved us with an unfailing love who has blessed us in many, many ways. We pray that your Holy Spirit would fall upon us afresh to renew us in love, in faith, in, comp in the gifts of grace. And so, Lord, we pray, show favour to us, your people, and increase in us the gifts of your grace, so that being made fervent in hope and love and faith, we may be ever watchful, in keeping your commands of love 
And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. I'll read the second verse of that hymn. It tells me of a Saviour's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. First reading today is from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 and 7 to 12. The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask something of me and I will give it to you. Solomon answered, O Lord my God, you have made me your servant king to succeed my father David, but I am a mere youth, not knowing at all how to act. I serve you in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a people so vast that it cannot be numbered or counted. Grant your servant, therefore, in an understanding heart, to judge your people and to distinguish right from wrong. Who is able to govern this vast people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon made this request. God said to him, Because you have asked for this, not for a long life for yourself, nor for riches, nor for the life of your enemies, but for understanding, so that you may know what is right and good, I do as you ask and give you a heart wise and understanding. And there has never been anyone like you up to now, and after you there will be no one to equal you. So that in that reading, we hear how Solomon prayed for wisdom, and God was pleased that he sought that above riches and, uh, and personal glory. And that's for us too, that we... Um, more important than worldly wealth is knowing Jesus and knowing God in the, the power of his love and knowing the kingdom of God. Moving on to a psalm, from Psalm 119, um, certain verses from it, and there's a kind of response, the phrase, Lord, I love your commands, repeated several times. So when I, when I say it, maybe you'll repeat it. Lord, I love your commands. I've said, O Lord, that my part is to keep your words. The law of your mouth is to me more precious than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Lord, I love your commands. Lord, I love your commands. Let your kindness comfort me according to your promise to your servants. Let your compassion come to me that I may live. Your law is my delight, Lord. I love your commands, Lord. I love your commands. I love your command more than gold, however fine, for in all your precepts I go forward. Every false way I hate, Lord, I love your commands. Wonderful are your decrees. I observe them. The revelation of your word sheds light, giving understanding to the simple, Lord, I love your commands. I love, Lord, I love your commands. And moving on to the Gospel reading. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man happens to find a treasure hidden in a field. He covers it up and is so happy that he goes and sells everything he has and then goes back and buys that field. So that's Matthew fourteen forty four, and going on to 45. Also the kingdom of heaven is like this. A man is looking for fine pearls, and when he finds one that is unusually fine, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that pearl. Also the kingdom of heaven is like this. Some fishermen throw their net out in the lake and catch all kinds of fish. When the net is full, they pull it to shore and sit down to divide the fish. The good ones go into their buckets, the worthless ones thrown away. It will be like this at the end of the age. The angels will go out and gather up the evil people from among the good and will throw them into the fiery furnace. Do you understand these things, Jesus asked them? Yes, they, they answered. And he replied, this means then that every teacher of the law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven 
is like the owner of a house who takes new and old things out of his storeroom. Amen and thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word and to him be all glory and praise. And it's good to know that some others have joined us, Richard and Melville and Rona, welcome and good morning and the others whose perhaps names aren't yet on the screen. Let us pray. Most gracious God, as we come before you today, we thank you for your word in scripture that guides us, that inspires us. We need you, Lord, to speak into our hearts in these difficult times that we might grow in love, keep the faith, be strong, be bold and full of mercy and compassion as you are merciful and compassionate. Speak to us through your word, in Jesus' name, Amen. That, when Jesus speaks that parable, the parable of the treasure found in the field, it reminds me a bit of the novel by Chuck Robert Louis Stevenson, Treasure Island, which is about a, a venture that is very costly in terms of money and costly in terms of lives indeed. Um, there's plenty of violence and shooting in, in that and fighting in that story to get the buried treasure that's in a, in a remote island somewhere in the West Indies. In the ancient world, people would sometimes bury treasures as a way of keeping them safe, bury them in the ground. And in this parable, we have someone who, who comes across uh, some treasure that's buried. Now, if, if it was the case that this person in the parable was... Um, in the field that belonged to his employer, um, he would have the employer would have had a claim to to the to the treasure that was found. So um, anyway, we don't we don't know if that's exactly the case. But anyway, the man in the parable goes and um, gets all the resources he needs, all the money he needs to buy the field, so that the treasure will indeed be um, his by entitlement. In the second parable, we have the merchant who sought after this pearl of great beauty. In the ancient world, pearls were sought after wherever they came from, not only for their monetary value, but for their intrinsic beauty. And these parables are saying that however we come across the knowledge of Jesus, the knowledge of God's kingdom, however we become aware of the reality and the call of Jesus in our lives, whether it's after a search, whether we come across it almost by chance, it's something worth going for, it's worth giving our all for. It's worth the commitment of time and faith and energy and the sacrifice that Jesus calls us. He calls us to come and follow him. And for many of those disciples that heard him speak when Jesus was teaching them, they had left their, some of them had left their nets behind their lives. Fishermen who'd left their nets behind, they'd all made costly commitments to follow Jesus. But, and however we make our commitment, that commitment is worthwhile. It's worth all the effort and the sacrifice of time and toil and struggle that it may involve. And so whenever we come to the reality of Jesus, of his call to us to follow him, we must take that and respond gladly with a conscious decision to follow the Saviour, to follow Jesus. Jesus was saying, to people, it was within your grasp to find the kingdom of God, to enter into it, to experience its power and its authority and what Jesus can do and what God's power can do for you. That's within our grasp. And we can therefore seize the opportunity, receive him gladly. Um, discipleship, therefore, may be a costly experience, may be demanding but it's worth, worth it and it's worth the prize of being found complete in Christ. And then that last verse, verse 52, describes the scribe who becomes a disciple. I suppose that would be particularly appropriate to those who had been educated in the 
Jewish scriptures, and now they were discovering the fulfillment of these scriptures in Jesus Christ. But they would have a knowledge to draw upon and they would, that would really help them and help them to understand what Jesus was doing and how he was fulfilling prophecies. Being able to wed the old to the new, that's something that comes through knowledge of the Bible. It reminded me of that passage about having things out your store cupboard to pull out. It reminded me of what it is um, to have a well-stocked food cupboard in the house. It means if you've got a, a notion to go and make something, um, you might need one or two extra ingredients, but you'll have lots of the things that you might need you'll find tucked away at the back of your cupboard. Some people, indeed, during lockdown, when things were getting a bit scarce, discovered hidden treasures in their larder. So, applied to today, that is saying um, all of us have treasures. All of us have skills. All of us have knowledge that comes from our life experience and from our knowledge of the Bible and being in church. And, the ch and we can bring that skill, that knowledge, that insight, those abilities um, to bear in the Christian life, in the church. If we use our gifts, our knowledge, whatever it is of, um, if we use it in a Christian way, if we use it prayerfully, if we use it for doing it for Jesus, um, then we can make such a difference and contribute to others. Um, and the wonderful thing is in the church there are lots of people around who have things to offer, who have skills to offer, who have gifts to offer, knowledge to offer, um, things that are like old and new that have come out of the storeroom to enrich the life of the church. When Let's look forward to the days when we do get back in meeting together and we can all more freely share our insights and our gifts with one another. So the message perhaps is don't abandon the sense that you're, you've got something to offer, but let's find ways to use our gifts and abilities prayerfully um, in Christian love and compassion and think I'm doing this for Jesus. Um, as we let's move on to praying and I think we need to pray for the church as we think about ways of getting back into how it might be possible to start meeting again in the next few weeks. Let's think about the church bringing God's word to people today, to the call of the kingdom in our hearts to be for receptive lives and receptive hearts. Let's pray too for the victory of God over the coronavirus, that his power will indeed be, will vanquish it. So let us pray. Lord, we ask for the church, for those in leadership in the church nationally and locally, that the church may be bold and strong to bring the word of Jesus to a generation who are not altogether familiar with it, Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray, Lord, for ourselves and for others, for a heart that's receptive to your word. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for your victory, Lord, over the coronavirus, over the pandemic. Lord, that it may be eradicated and totally conquered because, Lord, you have the power. Come, Lord Jesus, and overcome the darkness and the forces of destruction. We pray for our own areas that we may remain clear of it. And we pray for any who are affected by the coronavirus that they will be completely cured. Lord, hear our prayers. 
We pray for those in government that they will act wisely. For MSPs and councillors and MPs. And now we pray for ourselves. And in a few moments of silence we bring our own thoughts and prayers. And remembering how Jesus encourages us to think of each other as brothers and sisters as a family and to look unto God as our Heavenly Father, we pray in, in his words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Now read the last verse of that hymn, the, the, Jesus, the name I love so well, the name I love to hear. No saints on earth its worth can tell, no heart conceive how dear. Oh, how I love the Saviour's name. Oh, how I love the Saviour's name. Oh, how I love the Saviour's name. The sweetest name on earth. So let's conclude with praying for God's blessing. Gracious and eternal God, we come before you as your children. Please send us with your blessing. And may the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, guard our hearts and our thoughts in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us now and for evermore. Amen. So thank you for watching everybody, including two Marians, Rona Melville, Richard and um, Jean and Colin. Um, God bless and those who God and thank you too for those who watch later on. Um, God bless and take care and stay safe. Bye for now.